Welcome to Field Sports Britain. That's a lot of glass. This week we're interested in the glass inside this building, where it's an optics factory where they make binoculars and rifle scopes. you've probably guessed, we're in Germany. The reason we're in Germany is optics. Zeiss optics, the very best. We're going behind the scenes, front of house and down at the range. First, we need to go through the red tape to get behind the blue sign. Ordinary looking building from the outside, but like with so much field sports kit, it is in fact a secret military establishment. The bosses at Zeiss were understandably reluctant to allow us to film here. Indeed, this is the first time that the cameras have been into Zeiss headquarters. Hi. Welcome, Charlie. Welcome to Westford, Charlie. Good to see you. Whether it's for spotting foxes in moonlight or aiming at deer at great distances on the hill, binos and scopes are made of metal, glass and air. Zeiss improves all three. First up, I find out about metal, and it's not just any old iron. So, Mark Kahn, Carl Zeiss Limited Sports Optics. <laughs> yes, sir. Do you really expect me to buy this as a scope? This looks rubbish. Not at this stage, but saying that, finest aircraft uh, specification aluminium. This is the basis of all our scopes, whether it's the Victory, the Classic, or the Duralit series. And uh, when it comes here into the factory, it's allocated to certain machines depending on the size of the rifle scope. So this is your basic starter for the rifle scope series. It's heavy, isn't it? It's an awful lot of aluminium that's going to go to waste here. You just throw it away afterwards. Not at all. It's, uh, we, we recycle, obviously very aware of the environment in this day and age. Ooh. And as you say, <laughs> you're not going to see a lot through it at the moment. Not a great deal. No. <laughs> OK, where do we go next? OK, so what happens is they take this, they then use the machines, and you start a process of turning and milling and as you can see, we've already now started to, to take the form of a rifle scope. You've got your elevation, your windage showing, the uh, magnification changer. So we're at an early stage of our rifle scope series. Let's have a look. So, right, okay, still no glass in it, obviously. Still no glass at this stage. Well, I'm beginning to believe this is something I could use on a, what about this one, a fox, do you think? You could use it on a fox. Dear, it's it's a good all-round scope Fairly because classic. obviously it's twilight performance. That's the process. Okay. Um, the, the workman here will then do some manual burring just to remove some of the smaller particles from here. Okay, so there's a bit of machine milling and a bit of manual rubbing and at, at, at this stage, and then from here it goes into a vat of ceramic marbles, yep. which is for even more burring. So we we go another step further. And what happens, you then end up um, going on to the next stage. Yep. And the next stage involves um, glass pearl blasting. Yes. And you will see from here, it looks very similar to the second stage. Yes. But literally by rubbing your hand over it, this is a lot smoother. Oh, it is, yes. So but it's not shiny anymore not shiny anymore That's so it's, shame, it? It, it's getting ready for its anodizing process okay now when it's at this stage it's not going to be handled without gloves because obviously any marks on it could affect the anodizing process this one doesn't matter though we, we at the, no, for, for this purpose right. you can you can handle it Phew. and the final stage of all this is the anodizing both internally Ooh. and externally that looks just like a real scope it's, it's there, all we need in is a few internal elements. From metal to the next stage, glass, and they buy it in bulk. Wolf, um, what have we got here and um, where are we? We are in the glass storage now. Uh, that means flat optics department. And I would like you to demonstrate us your fitness. I see. Please try. <laughs> you want me to pick this up? Okay. It is heavy. 
Unquestionably, you yes. must be very strong to work yeah. here. Yeah. <laughs> it's uh, 60 kilos each, and we have our daily workout uh, Six, down here. 16, 16 kilos. 16 kilos each yeah. block. I thought for a minute there I was incredibly strong. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so this is flat glass, and that's that's not the round glass no. that magnifies things. That's mm -hmm. the bits that go in mm -hmm. the middle of the scopes mm -hmm. and the mm -hmm. binoculars that are yeah. flat. Yeah? yeah. Tell me about that. The round ones are the lenses. And these parts uh, are uh, used for the production of prisms, mm -hmm. roof prisms. You call it straight uh, prisms. Okay, that's the ones, the prisms you look through that way yeah. rather than the binocular ones which go yeah. sort of like yes. that. Yeah. And uh, these prisms, uh, they have an outstanding precision. So working here in this department uh, is really a demanding job and only specialists are Working but in surely they get, they get a bit, I mean, they just do the flat glass. They must get a bit jealous of the people who do the special round glass. I mean, that, that's a lot better, isn't it? No, well, two of them are very challenging uh, jobs, and we will see later uh, the details of uh, the flat glass and uh, the round glass, the lens department. Okay. So um, you take this and, and you chop it up, and that's not just the, the bit that goes at the front and the back of the scope, is it? That's, that's no. The, the one in the, the in the middle, yes. We will cut slices and then we will see how uh, these slices are used for uh, the production uh, of cylinders for the Bari Point Rifloscope. Upstairs our slice is soon diced and we start seeing things take shape. Now we're going to go from the world of flat glass to the more glamorous world of round glass. <laughs> The interferometer is not, as it sounds, the work of a Bond villain or Ming the Merciless, but measures how good lenses are. Parallel lines show that the lens is perfect from one direction, and concentric circles show it is perfect from another. The jiggling you can see is because the machine is so sensitive it picks up fluctuations in the warm air around the lens. Remember those blanks? This is what they look like now! There's more washing of the lenses in water and alcohol. If you are ever washing your binos or scope, try to do it in deionized water. With tap water, the acids attack the coating and the calcium clogs them up. And there is reticle making, where the crosshairs are applied in the dark room and the discs of polished glass with these reticles on are cut out. And there is the coating process itself. Like Coca-Cola and its recipe, Zeiss keeps the coating process a big secret. But for the first time, we're allowed to know a little. One of these is magnesium, one of these is aluminium. This is the true magic of Zeiss. They fire electrons through these in this, this thousand degree oven over here and they coat the lenses and it's the coating that is the key to a great scope and a great pair of binoculars. And that's not the only thing that's off limits. Hey, look, Wolf, tanks! Hey. Can, we, uh, can we stop and uh, no, see? No, no. Nine! Nine! Okay, periscopes okay. down! Yeah, We're gathering components from all corners of the factory and now it's time to start sticking them together. So where are we, uh, where are we going now? Right, we're now going to enter the assembly room, which is a clean room, and as a result, the first thing we've got to do is change our clothes. Let's go! Ah, German efficiency. One thing that doesn't mix with optics is foreign objects. Particles gather on the lenses. In the world of Zeiss, cleanliness is next to godliness, and even our camera equipment gets tough treatment for stubborn stains. So they take all the bits mm -hmm. and they put them together. Yeah. And, uh, and, and then what do they do? Yeah. And everybody is a quality inspector too. That means everybody does internal quality control. They all have a little badge. Yeah. <laughs> they do it on top. And of course, there is a final inspection uh, of all rifle scopes. And the very last production step is nitrogen filling. Okay. Nitrogen is a gas mm -hmm. and it avoids condensation inside yep. coming from uh, the warm into cold area or, or other way around, uh, that's done over here. These are the, the two 
places where we do the final control, where we do another uh, additional parallax test, where we uh, do all the last steps uh, controlling uh, the elements, uh, the positions of the reticles and all that. We started with the idea of the scopes needing water and, and mm -hmm. air, and, mm -hmm. and now in the 21st century it's about no water and yes. no, no air. Of course, yes. <laughs> As I said, dust is the main enemy because uh, our eyepiece is a magnifying glass and improves the size of a particle inside, and of course no hunter uh, being out in the countryside under strong uh, rain or fog uh, needs a problem with his scope or his binocular. Due to them, they are waterproof and fogproof. The new Duralit range of, shall we say, cheaper scopes all go through this room. They're all made in Germany alongside the top quality scopes, but there are fewer processes involved in making them. They're still getting their dose of Vorsprung durch Technik. But I'm not allowed to look too closely at this. No, please. <laughs> now, we are again entering uncharted territory, and even Mark Kahn has never been over this threshold. With a state-of-the-art device for measuring light transmission, this is Zeiss's counter-intelligence department. Right. OK, this is the information <laughs> they don't want us to see, but we've got out of them. These are the Zeiss very point scope figures. OK, weird-looking graph. That is your light transmission. That's 90% in daylight. That's the daylight curve just there. It's even 88%, two fat ladies, in nighttime. And over here is a cheaper scope. Let's say it goes down like that. That's your daylight, only 84%. That's your nighttime, only 83%. Here, I'll write it in 84, 83. Back to this one 90, 88%. Now, that is a 5% difference which is your 20 minutes at the end of the day. How do you think of that? Protect the innocent. Of course, we've blotted out their names. Food for thought. It seems you get what you pay for. If I wanted to shoot an elephant, it would cost thousands. But I'm about to get that for peanuts. Well, at the end of a long, hard day on the range, they said, do you want to come to the cinema? Well, I said, I probably won't understand the film. Could I have some nuts to throw at the screen? So they got me some nuts, but they said, what you really want is these bullets. This is a slightly unusual cinema. They've given me a rifle that Theus has just here, and there's uh, going to be a boar running across there, and it's got live rounds in it, and I'm going to try and shoot the boar three times, and then they're going to rerun the film and see how I did. Okay. 30. See that one again? Yes. Yeah, oh, nearly. <laughs> no, bad, bad. Mm, what do we think? Firing a bit low. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Practice. More practice. <laughs> Happy? Is that good fun? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> The cinema is not exclusive to Zeiss, and it is open to the public, but the Zeiss guys do put in plenty of hours here. People can use their products in use, that means with moving game, so they can move with the game and they don't shoot to normal standstill targets. Yeah, and what, about, and what happens to the bullets? Do they end up in a big screen and they must change the screen every few weeks? Well, no. Actually, what you have, um, Dynamit Nobel has developed a very special bullet, which is called Cinesha. So you shoot to a kind of screen, and after, I think, two or three months, we just roll it up. And the computer can recognize the dots and the impacts on the screen, and based on that, you can see after the shoot exactly by the red dot where your impact was on the game. So we, we will have a look at the screen, and we'll, we'll see holes in it. Yes. Definitely, but they're so small so that you don't see them from far away. 
and, but the computer who has a kind of sensor can recognize the impact and can show it to you. It's been an interesting day at the factory and if there's one thing I've learned, Great Optics needs glass, water and alcohol. We start day two at the range, where I meet one of Zeiss's top technicians, Volker Cloudy. Volker is a sportsman. He challenges me to a race. Who can mount and zero a scope the fastest? He may be in with a chance with this one. He has accepted a few handicaps. His second best tools, I get the bench and he gets the zero on the 300 metre range, while I get it easy with the 100 metre range. Easy? Well, we'll see about that. Go. I didn't do too badly, but Volker hits the 300 meter target after just 80 seconds of scope preparation. Okay. Congratulations, Volker. Thank you very much. <laughs> well done, you are, the, you are the best. Now, this scope, tell, tell me about this mounting system. Tell me about this. This is very easy to assemble, disassemble, and mount it on the rifle. It's no problem. You but can see. But it's also no problem to shoot again after dismounted and mounted. Like that, but you have to re-zero it now. You have to take it back and no, no. You don't have not, to re-zero. Not it. necessary. Fantastic. Okay, good system. <laughs> Very good system. Brilliant. In three minutes, and he did it in 80 seconds the first part, and I was only 25 seconds behind him, but I, I lost. <laughs> they bring a huge selection of kit for us to play with at the range, including a 458 elephant gun with a 665-pound Duralit scope on it. <laughs> It's a heavy bullet and drops a foot every 100 yards. Want to shoot at 300 yards, you'd need Carol Vorderman beside you to do the maths. There. Well, not a terribly difficult shot at 100 metres by Zeiss's top technician, Volker. Now, this is an ordinary scope, and to go from 100 metres where he was shooting to the 300 metre range, you'd have to go click, 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 with the special maths. Volker has an even more advanced scope on his rifle. Volker, how, um, how do you go from 100 metres to 300 metres with this scope? No problem. That's it? That's it. Just lift and... Not more. Absolutely amazing. It is, of course, another Zeiss innovation. The bullet drop compensator takes the pain out of re-zeroing your rifle. You know your rifle is zeroed at 100 metres. Lift the turret from one and drop it at three, and bingo, it's suddenly yeah, zeroed at 300 metres. Zeiss calls this the ASV system, Absehen Schnellverstellen, which is German for fast reticle adjustment, what we call bullet drop compensator, and it's available on all scopes except the cheaper Duralit range. You can even have it retrofitted to your Zeiss scope. So just how tough is this scope and rail system? Well, we're going to put this rifle through the kind of paces that the British stalking season will give it. First of all, I'm going to do this. <laughs> well, Zeiss wasn't uh, very happy with uh, uh, the way we pulled off that stunt. And so to explain how bad the English weather can be for a rifle and scope combination, they've asked to take over the next step. <laughs> That's a good one. Back at the factory, Zeiss puts its scopes through a much tougher regime of weather, including temperature tests down to minus 40 degrees centigrade. The glass may have frosted up, but the parts still move perfectly. So, battered and bruised, and that's just me, we see if the soaking rifle and scope have held zero. Yep, spot on. Well, Mark, we've spoken a great deal about Zeiss. Let's talk about the customer. And that okay. You'd be my personal shopper, and I'm a customer who's come into a shop that's full of these things, of rifle scopes. And I've got a sort of vague idea about the size of rifle scope okay. I want, because I know what I shoot, but I just don't know where to start choosing. What, what should I look for? Okay, I, I think it's very simple. Basically, 
ask to, to get hold of the scope and depending on the type of shop, how long the shop is, look to a dark area. Uh, try and recreate shooting in low light conditions. Find something in a dark area that you can focus on. So while you're then focusing, what I would suggest is check your eye relief because with, with some rifle scopes, um, when you change magnification, especially on a variable magnification, your eye relief changes. So you should be able, while you're focusing into the dark corner, you yep. should be able to move the magnification up and down. Now with a Zeiss scope, your eye relief remains constant. Yeah. And obviously that's important because the last thing you want is to, <laughs> is to have a bit of a knock in the eye. So, so you're saying with a cheap scope I'd be doing this kind of thing while I've, while in, I've changed the magnif magnification? In some cases that can be the case. So you should have constant eye relief through the entire magnification range. And looking at the dark corner, I'm just basically checking to see I can see stuff in the dark corner. If it's just black, then obviously again, not, not great for what I want to do in twilight. Exactly, exactly that. Anything else I can look for? Well, we just mentioned light. What I would say, and, and at the game fairs, we get a lot of questions. For instance, we, we have an 856 rifle scope with a one inch tube. Right, that's, that's eight, eight what? Eight, eight magnification. magnification yep. And the 56 objective diameter, sim similar to this model, which is a, a 56 objective. Right. And people say, oh, it's a one inch tube. Why don't you have it in a 30 mil tube? And if you've got 30 mil mounts and you're upgrading to a Zeiss, I understand that question. A lot of people say, because I want more light. The tube does not dictate the light. And if I so give that's the tube, that's it bit. So they're saying if it's a smaller tube, then less light can go through it. That's the perception. If I can give you a very quick uh, mathematical equation, yeah. 56 lens collects the light. There's a little hole here at the end, your exit pupil. Yep. The size of that is magnification divided into the objective. Eight and a 56 is seven mil. Right. Why is seven mil important? Well, seven mil is the maximum that the human eye will go to in low light conditions, but that's also dependent on age. As we get older, um, our pupil may not go to seven. It's not to say at 50, 60, it's X. So my, my seven year old kid would have a, an eight by 114 or something like that. <laughs> they may have slightly larger exit pupil in low light than we have. I think he does better maths than I do as well. <laughs> but the basis of this is an 856 with a one inch tube, an 856 30 mil tube. 56 collects the light. Yep. Eight in a 56, seven mil delivers the light. Right. Okay. So, but what we're saying is this tube size doesn't matter. It probably just gets a tiny bit warmer. No. What, <laughs> what you do get with a 30 mil tube is is more elevation and more windage. Okay. Okay. Now, one word which has always terrified me in uh, in uh, rifle shops when it comes to scopes is the word para parallax. Some parallax error. Should I be frightened of parallax? Uh, it's, it's something to bear in mind, but if they're set parallax free at, at 100 meters, yep. the easiest way to explain it is, you know, vignetting. That's a dark ring around the outside of the image. Exactly yeah. that. If it's set at 100 meters and your target is, is 100 meters away, no matter if you're slightly off, you're still gonna, you're still gonna achieve your, your end result. Where the cross is is where the bullet's gonna go. Exactly, right. exactly. Um, it can vary closer you come, obviously, but, um, you know, if you're straight behind the line, no problem. No. If you're slightly to one side, though, it's going to go a little bit to one side. Is this like, is this like when your, uh, your, your wife's looking at your speedometer and she's saying you're speeding, darling, but it's because she's seeing it from an angle. She thinks you're speeding and you're seeing it from the, the driving side. In traditional families where the male is the driver, obviously, then you know you're not speeding. You could say it's similar. A bit like that. Bit okay, like that. right. You so know, that's make it okay. I'm no longer going to be frightened of parallax. Right. The last thing I want to know. Certainly. Okay. Is uh, is what we mean by focal planes? Is it focal planes? Uh, the, the reticle, whether yeah, it's in the first the focal goes. plane or in the second focal plane. Because some people like some and some people like the other, don't they? Certainly. I mean, in the United Kingdom, uh, we were at one point very much first focal plane, as, as they are in Germany. In America, they like second focal plane. So what does first and what does second do? Yep. Well, let's find out with help from the cameraman. David, for this demonstration purposes only, I'm the target and I'm in the first image plane. So as you increase the magnification, I get larger, but I still remain within your posts. And that is first image plane. Now for this purposes, we now do second image plane. So I will go back to the beginning. And in this instance, you're at low power. When I, you increase the power, I move forward, but the reticle doesn't move. 
So I get larger, the reticle remains constant. That's how to buy a scope that's shiny and new. But what do you do when you reckon your scope has gone wrong? Of course, Zeiss has a service department. Run by Klaus Felgenauer, he shows me that the kit in this rack alone is for just one scope. Cheap scopes have 20 components, Zeiss scopes have up to 200 components. And he has racks of replacement parts for scopes going back 50 years. This guy is smashing havens into your scopes, so you're the, you're the service department. What's going on here? Uh, yeah, well, I am in charge of the service department, yes, and sometimes it really looks like we would break things, but we don't. Just to calm you down, yeah, everything is fine. All we try is, if you can't break the scope, we do our best to do it, so. <laughs> <laughs> so really you're proving it's, it's pretty unbreakable, I can't bear to watch. <laughs> terrible. No, what we do here is really just uh, shock proving the rifle scopes. So pretty often we receive uh, claims on the rifle scope is not shock proof, mm -hmm. yeah. Doesn't hold the point of impact. And all we get, of course, is the rifle scope. Best case with the mounts, but in no case, of course, with the rifles. So all we can do here is really checking the rifle scope on its own. If it's holding the point of impact, the reticle, yes or no. And that's what we do with the hammer here and by use of a collimator. All the top people in Zeiss Sport Optics are shooters and the Vice President Marketing and Sales is no exception. We have white bar, we have uh, rhodia, we have a lot of um, foxes and all these things, but um, plenty of white bar and they make a lot of damage in the field. So hunting is a must to avoid damage, you know, in the corn and the wheat. And um, So it's a sort of pest control activity as well it as is. everything else? Sometimes it's hard work. Yeah. And you have to do everything during night, which is not easy. <laughs> oh really? Okay. Oh yeah. yeah, they are not day active, they come during night. And we're not allowed to use um, spotting lights or night vision enhancements, so you have really to go at night during moon. And so it's a good test for our equipment. It certainly is. You need yeah. light transmission in your optics. Uh, and it must be difficult working here and being able to see it over there. And you, you know, you're just a kilometer away. You difficult is actually to find the time to go hunting because um, we are very busy, busy and I, I sell optics. And of course, whenever I have the time, I love to test them in the field. So what secrets has Zeiss got in the cupboard for British shooters next year? Honestly, it's a big city. We, we will have a great innovation. Um, it will be fantastic for UK. Um, but I can only kindly invite you to our booth. Come there with your camera and um, see what we will introduce. Sorry not to give you more details. <laughs> but you will love it, I promise you. <laughs> I'll have to put the thumb screws on you, I think. <laughs> no chance. <laughs> okay. Well, our visit to Zeiss has come to an end, and I'm pleased to leave this factory richer in knowledge, and I'm hoping richer in a few more things too. We're back next week. This has been Field Sports Talk. So much. Some more. And hey. I'd have got away with it too if it hadn't Tiny been one. for that meddling Wolfgang. Hey.